reading of God's Word today is in Psalms 33, starting with verse 12 through 22. Blessed is the nation who calls God, whose God is the Lord, the people he chooses for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the heart of all, who considers everything they do, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all his great strength, it cannot save. But the eye of the Lord on those who fear Him, on those who hope is in His unfailing love, to deliver them from death and to keep them alive and family. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hopes in you. So be it. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you are our hope and our strength, Lord. Help us to focus our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, help us to live lives that are of worth, Father, rather than focusing on the things of this world. Help us to walk by faith, not by sight. Lord, we just pray that your Spirit is upon this place today, that you speak to us through your words, Lord, and that we not only hear, but we apply the things to make a difference in this world, that we are your church, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the freedoms that we have and the opportunity to worship you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this message is entitled, Make Every Effort to Keep Unity. And you'll see that because it'll be a little obvious when we get into our passage. The main passage that we're going to be looking at is Ephesians chapter 4, the first 13 verses. Make every effort to keep unity. Why is that? Because without unity, we will never be able to make a difference in this world. And as the song said, the lyric said, that I don't want to waste my life. I've wasted so much of it. I don't want to be that way. And I don't want that to be the way for any of you. God called me to shepherd this church, and I want you to realize the spiritual blessings that we can have, that we do build up treasures in heaven, not in treasures on earth. And Paul talks about how we can do this in Ephesians chapter 4. Unity is a state of being united or joined as a whole. Oneness, one unit, functioning together, many parts. We lived in a divided country. Wednesday I had the opportunity to, to uh, talk and preach at the community worship service. And the theme that I had was unity, one nation under God. Are we? Uh, we Barry said it this, this morning. <laughs> our country needs prayer. Our, we need to support our elected officials, whoever they are, because we need to remember that God is still in control. He can use them. And this country is not one nation under God. It is a very divided country. That's obvious before the election. It's obvious after the election. And so much of this division is in our church also, where there needs to be not a hint, not a sign, not a whisper of division, but instead we need to stand united because we serve one God. We have one Spirit, one Savior, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. There should be no disunity whatsoever. It's something that God demands of His children, but it's something we need to realize and learn. So that's what Paul was saying in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. The King James Version starts off with therefore. And the reason it starts off with therefore is because Paul is making a plea in the first three chapters that we have such an incredible gift. That we've been called and that we were known who we were going to be in Christ long before the creations of anything that we understand. That God loved us so much and he, he sent Jesus to die for our sins. That He empowered us through 
through Jesus. The first uh, few verses are one long sentence of that glorious claim of who we are because God loved us so much and who we are in Christ. So he says, therefore, and he's already called himself an apostle in verse 1. An apostle is one that is sent. He knows that he is, his calling is to preach the gospel message. That's why in Romans it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. But here he says he's a prisoner. He doesn't say he's an apostle. He doesn't say he's a servant. But he literally is in prison for Christ. And thank goodness we are, he is. Because that shows you how God can use the things that we find. There's no way to be used. God can use them. As a prisoner, Paul wrote many of his letters to the different churches. It's a time that he could sit down and write rather than being there with them. These words that we could have that would stand the test of time. And this letter is a letter written basically to all churches. It's just as relevant today as it is then. And the letter was probably designed then to pass on to the different churches. So he says he's a prisoner. He's, he's enslaved for what he believes. Not only is he a slave, but now he's captive in and in chains. So he urges us or beseeches us to live a life, or the King James Version says to walk, worthy, appropriately, as becoming of a godly sort. The word that is used there is the same word that we get uh, ax axiom from, which means of equal weight. So what he is saying in the first three chapters bears equal weight in the last chapters. Because of all the goodness that God has done for you, all the wonderful things, we should live a life worthy, something to balance that out. Now, can we ever do that? No, but we can strive for it. So that's why Paul says that he urges us to live a life worthy, to walk worthy of the calling or the vocation, the job that we've been given, which is to be a herald, a messenger, to be a foreigner in this land, to be a servant, to be an apostle, to be a prisoner if necessary, set apart, made holy, to be the person that delivers the gospel message to a world that doesn't know Jesus. <clears throat> Romans works the same basic way. We see through the first 11 chapters, we see how Paul is making his plea. And then in, verse, in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you or beseech you. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His perfect and pleasing will. So Paul's making the same plea here. I've told you all these things. You understand this, and he's telling it to the church. Now it's time for action. It's a call to action. Are you going to be doers of the Word or just hearers only? Are you going to make a difference? And if we're going to make a difference, we have to stand united. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3, you'll get a little set up to chapter 4. In verse 10, it's written, His intent was that now through the church, Paul is telling us that as a body of believers, that's how we're going to make a difference. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly, what, heavenly realms. The manifold wisdom is like a beautiful tapestry woven together. So many colors, vibrant colors, everything. To paint a picture of God's will and plan for redemption to this earth. That even though we sin against a righteous and holy God, He still loves us. He decides to have mercy and grace upon us. He decides to redeem us back through the blood of His only Son to spend eternity with Him, not only with Him, but as His children, that we will receive all the inheritance that a child deserves, or not necessarily deserves, but gets. This is going to happen through the church, the body of believers, not as individuals, but united for God's purpose, His plan, joined together in unity of the Spirit under the authority of one head, Jesus Christ. That's why it is so easy to walk with these other ministers because it doesn't matter that he sees differently than I do about this topic or she sees differently about this or I don't believe baptism is this way or that way. We all unite together because we believe that there is one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there is no division because we preach Jesus Christ. So we can stand there together and support each other as long as we know that we have that one bind and then we're united together in the Spirit to empower us where we can't stand alone. In Ephesians chapter 3, it goes on to say in verse 16, 
I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And we talked about that power, that it's something that we cannot even imagine. Much stronger than the the winds of a terrible tornado or anything. But it's usable power. It's not destructive power. It's power that's used to be built, to be harnessed in the lives of individual Christians. And then applied collectively. Can you imagine how that power will be? If we have that power individually, when we apply it collectively to this world, hell's gates cannot stand against us. Literally. goes on to say in verse 17, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. It all starts with our faith, and our faith walks us all the way through it. And Paul says, And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. Love is what grounds us, which gives us that firm foundation that we love one another. That's why Jesus said, A new commandment that I give you to love one another. That's why he said, No greater love does a man have that, that he will lay down his life for his friend. Verse 18 says, In love that may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people, the church. Not this church, but the body of believers. All bodies of believers. Denominations don't matter as long as a person, as long as a denomination believes in the faith of Jesus Christ. Together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how deep, how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And also to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immensely more than, we, than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. So that's the ending of chapter 3. Paul is saying we need to be united as a church. I'm not speaking individually. I am speaking individually to each and every parted member, but I am talking to how these come together as a whole and make one. So, he says, I urge you or beseech you and beg you at the beginning of chapter 4 to talk, to walk, to live a life worthy, not worthless, but worthy, a life focused on things above, not on things below. <clears throat> becoming an appropriate of God to the vocation and the job in which we are called, to be a herald, to be an ambassador, to tell others about Jesus Christ, to be the salt and light of this world, to be the hands and feet, literally, of Jesus, as faithful servants and faithful stewards, by which God has called you, set you apart, sanctified you, made you holy. When you receive salvation and rebirth <coughs> through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's a pleading for a call to action so that together we can unite and make a true difference in this world. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. So how do we walk this walk? We're sinners, right? We can't do this. But we can by the power of the Spirit. Don't forget that. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Like I said before, that doesn't mean that I'm going to go out and win this football game. That means that I can walk a life worthy. Because if I die to myself, if I lay down my life to His, my will to His, and then let the Spirit empower me, I can do many mighty wonderful things. And then when you guys all come beside of me and we join together, we can literally make a difference in this community, in this world. There's no reason that there's poverty and suffering in this town because we have enough capacity to take care of that. Now, there are people that don't want to help themselves. There are all kinds of things that we have to consider in that. But we need to be giving and loving. We don't need to be worried about ourselves because Jesus says, why do you worry about the things of this earth? Doesn't God supply the needs of the sparrows? And how much more are you worth? So Paul gives us some steps to walk this walk. He tells us in the next verse how to do it. Verse 2. He says, Be completely, totally humble, gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love. Three steps that we need to follow, and they have to be followed in that order. They have to be done completely. Humbleness is not a concept that's taught in this world today. It's a sign of weakness. 
But who was the most humble person that ever lived that set the example for us? Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. He gave up heaven and walked among His creation. The very people that He created that then spit in His face, turned His back on Him, and what did He do? He laid down His life for them. And He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He set the perfect example of humility. <clears throat> humility is the quality of a slave. You're right, it is. Paul's clear about that. He said, I am a servant, I'm a slave, I'm a doulios. I lay down my life because without Jesus Christ, I would have been headed for an eternal destruction. But because of what He did, I have eternal life and I am a child of God. So he says, it's all I can do to lay down my life willingly to Him. That's the least that I can do. I, I can never equal it, make it right. So all that I do have to give is my life, and I lay down it willingly as a slave. <clears throat> if you don't lay your life down willingly, then you're never going to experience the power of the Spirit. You're never going to experience the power of unity. You're never going to experience the true rewards that you should have in this lifetime. Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus both said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Once you were born again, you went into that kingdom of God as His child to, or her child. To start living today as a child of God, not in your future life. This should be simply a passing where we have lived today as a Christian should live. To walk a life and live a life worthy so that when we pass on, it's just a stepping point to where we're home finally. And like I've said before, we'll sing praises, we'll have a great time, we'll worship the King. But at that point, we won't have time to tell anyone else about Jesus. So that's the thing that we need to worry about and focus about today. Because there will be a time when we don't have time anymore to tell that neighbor or that friend or that child or that parent how much we love them. To unite with them, to get back into unity rather than division and tell them how much we love them because of how much God first loved us. Humbleness is the first step. It's the opposite of pride or nobility. Jesus had all that, didn't He? But He gave it away. The second step is to be gentle or meek. Again, just like our Lord and Savior was. It's a result of humility. That you can be kind, considerate, compassionate. The opposite is causing harm, unyielding, and disobedient. Meekness is a sign of even more weakness to this world. But again, it is exactly what our Lord and Savior taught us to do. It is a characteristic trait that comes from being submissive and something that you have to learn to be used by God. A gentle, the wind can be a gentle breeze, right? Or it can be a violent force. Don't ever let you think that the wind and the wind that's in you, the spirit of gentleness and meekness, is something to be ashamed of. It's a gift from the Spirit of God so that we can bring about unity. Do you remember the Beatitudes? They're very similar. They're Jesus' first teachings on the mount. In Matthew 5, verse 5, it says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. It's not a coincidence that he said they will inherit the earth. Because of your meekness, your gentleness, and kindness, you will affect this earth. Not the kingdom to come that's in heaven, but the kingdom that's here now. They will know you are a Christian by your love by being gentle, meek, and mild, compassionate, and loving. If you back up to verse 3, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Humbleness. So they're in the same order. I just did them out of order for you, so don't get confused. We see humbleness again before we see meekness. Those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They inherit the kingdom of heaven. They become God's child. And then, like I said, two verses later, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth as well. We have to learn to be meek. We have to learn to be loving so that we can be united in the Spirit, united in Christ. <clears throat> the third thing that Paul tells us to do is to be patient and long-suffering. Boy, he just gets tougher and tougher for these things, doesn't he? I don't know about you, but sometimes I can be mild and meek and nice, but then I walk away and say, I don't know about that person, what they did or whatever. It's tough to be long-suffering, to be patient. Each step gets tougher, but it's not if you submit more and more to God's will. As He fills you more and more with His Spirit, which you're already filled to capacity, 
the more and more this walk, this plan of action that Paul is giving you will become effective in your life. <clears throat> These three things are literally necessary so that we can bear one another in love. Because if I can't do these things, how am I ever going to love each and every one of you? Because there will be times that you upset me. And I'm sure there will be times that I upset you. But as long as we learn to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient and long-suffering, then we can get along. And we realize that we are united one in spirit, one Lord, one Savior, Jesus Christ, one God the Father that we're supposed to bring honor to then it makes it that much easier to see what our purpose and our cause is. Going back to Peter, in 1 Peter 3.8, he says, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Very similar words, isn't it? It's a recipe for a successful, worthy life rather than living a life of no worth. I don't want to be like the song says, and I don't want to to live a life that has no worth. And I pray that for each and every one of you. I don't know what your past has. I don't know what the present is going to hold for you, but I know what God has called us to be. He has called us to be holy as He is holy, to be humble, to be gentle, to be patient, so that we can make a difference in this world. Back to Ephesians verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3. It says, Make every effort to keep what? the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. Do everything you can. Strive with haste and diligence because it does matter. It is a time-sensitive issue. It is of utmost importance. Literally, souls are at stake. There can be no division. That's why it goes to unity, not something else. Make every effort to keep unity there, there'll be no division in the church, a oneness, a unitedness. One body, even though it's many members with Christ as its head, doing the gospel message so that we can bring glory and honor to God and bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The word used for unity here is henatos. It's only used in two verses of the Bible. This verse and the verse we're going to end this sequence with. It means that oneness that is only to be found in the body of Christ. This completeness, because it is God's plan to be one unit, the church. The church is the plan of salvation for this world, with each and every member doing its part. And we're going to read on along in a second, and we see that gifts are given so that we can do that. But we have to be united in one to do it. It's a fastening to make one, like a joint ties ligaments together in the human body. It binds us together so that we can have control and proper function so that when our mind tells us what to do, that we do what our mind tells us to do. Without this unity, how can we ever do what Jesus is telling us to do in this world? The bond is kept through having perfect peace. Bond is also a word for, for one. It's soon, soon desmos. It's a different meaning, but it can also be translated as one again. So two times in this verse... Paul uses one to describe the body of Christ, that we are to be one complete unit, bound together by peace. That reminds me of another beatitude. Imagine that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, we just talked about peace, for they will be called the children of God. See the progressive steps? Now we're acting like children of God because we're bringing about peace on this earth, and we will be called the children of God. So maybe if we act like Christ and realize we're called to be like Christ, that we're the church, that we're God's children, maybe we'll make a difference and the world will call us like Christ, that they'll say that we're children of God rather than hypocrites. I don't know about you, but I'd much be, re be rather to be seen that way than to be seen as a hypocrite. We are children of God. We have to remember that in everything that we do. I have to remember every time we get up and everything that we go to do, that we pray for the power of the Spirit to give us the submissiveness that we need, the humbleness that we need, the patience that we need. Because every day Satan is there trying us to get us to do just the opposite. Children of God acting like children of God. What a concept. 
James says in James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and, and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Hmm. Sounded like we just talked about, doesn't it? Well, let's go on in Ephesians chapter 4. We must be united. So how does the Bible define unity? Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That's what unity is. We're introduced to a third word used for one, and it is heis, just like ice with an H on it. I can pronounce that one. It's, it's simple compared to the others. There is one. It means the numeral one. There is only one body. There is only one spirit. There is one hope. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There is one God and Father of all. And see, we are one church. Not one to have divisions, but have unity. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have to stand united with them. That was the message of Wednesday night. That's what Henry's vision has been. That's what my vision has been. And it's coincidence that we're next-door neighbors in our businesses. Right. <laughs> we're constantly going back and forth telling each other, Hey, look what I read here in the Bible, and back and forth. And we're constantly sharpening each other and coming up with ideas to help this community. We are planning to do the Christmas baskets, of course. We're trying to plan a toy drive of some kind and maybe a food drive as well as the baskets. We want to infect this community for Jesus Christ. doesn't matter that He doesn't believe exactly like I believe or vice versa. And guess what? We can even worship together. We proved that too, didn't we, Bob? Acts chapter 4 tells us about the early church. And I just want to read a few verses here because I want you to remember how that early church acted. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. After they played, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they were testifying. That's what they were telling others. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, all of them, that they, there were no needy persons among them. Wow. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put, all, put it all at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Reading on in chapter 5, verse 42, it says, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Chapter 6, verse 1, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Verse 7, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. There's your plan. The people were doing exactly what Paul was talking about doing. They were submitting. They were being gentle and kind. They didn't worry about themselves. They worried about others. They sold their own possessions if necessary. They were patient and long-suffering with each other. They were bound together in unity of the Spirit and peace, and they made an impact upon their world. They preached the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and their numbers increased daily. Nothing's changed. That's what the church is supposed to do. That's our call today. <clears throat> We've got to walk that way. There is one church, one, the numeral. That means there will be, there always will be. It will be something that lasts for all eternity. So we've got to realize that today and not be divided but stand in unity. There is one church. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Each and every single member, unit of the body, every little part from what we find is insignificant to what we find is very important. They all have parts to play. They all have gifts of grace that God has given them. As He apportioned to do what He planned and willed. 
Verse 8 says, That is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. Now what Paul is referencing here is Psalms chapter 68, specifically verse 18. The Ark of the Covenant is being brought in victory to Mount Zion. And whenever you had victory, you got the spoils of the victor. And the spoils went to the king of that time. But the king of all kings didn't keep the spoils. He gave them back to his children to use in ministry. So Paul is using something that's familiar to the Jews, but he's also saying God Himself, Christ, gave back all the spoils and conquerors of this earth. He defeated death and everything else and gave you life and gifts of grace that you can minister to each and every one of individuals. That's our calling. Verse 9 says, What does He ascended mean except that He also descended to the low, lower earthly regions? And maybe yours has a parenthesis there. The parentheses will end in verse 10, which says, He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Or the King James Version says that He might fill all things. We play a role, the church does, not only on earth, but in heavenly realms if you don't understand that. The angels and the other heavenly beings that we don't even know or comprehend of are watching what's going on to see what we do in God's redemptive plan so that we can bring glory and honor to God. Jesus ascended to heaven and gave us victory. He is also the one, though, that descended to the earth and gave up His crown so that we might could live. The total example of someone who is humble, someone who is meek, someone who is patient. Oh, was Jesus patient too. Look at His disciples that kept betraying Him, that didn't understand, and He was patient and long-suffering with them. What a marvelous plan of redemption that God has. So back to verse 11. So Christ Himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He gave these gifts to build up the body. But why did Christ give them? Verse 12. To equip His people for works of service. There you go. Did you get that? To equip His people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up. I like the King James Version better because it says for perfecting of the saints. It reminds me that I'm a saint instead of an ain't. That I'm wholly consecrated and set apart. That no one can take that away from me because I believe in Jesus Christ and I've been saved and I carry His righteousness. And it says perfecting. That doesn't just mean equipping, but it means fully and completely equipping to perfection. I'm perfect in God's eyes and I'm fully equipped to do the job that He's called me to do. I need to remember that. Because there are many days when I get up and say, I can't do this, Lord. He says, it's already been done. you just got to walk in my spirit and submit your will and walk faithfully. Walk by faith, not by sight. It's a perfectly equipping us so that the body may be built up or edified so that it can be all that it can be. Verse 13 says, until we reach unity, there we see that word henatos again. It's the second time and the only other time it's used in Scripture. So that we can reach unity, oneness. He's come completely through what He's saying here. All of the things that God has done for us, all the graciousness that we have, the, the end result of our salvation, the fact that we are sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty, all of these things should help us bring about unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God so that we might become mature, fully grown, finished, lacking nothing attaining the whole measure, the stature, or the fullness of Jesus Christ Himself. Notice it says, until we all reach unity. I can do some things. You can do some things. But when we come united together as a body of Christ and go out beyond these walls as well as a body of Christ, we can impact this world. We can make a difference. We can stop the rioting in the streets. We can let people know that God loves them and He is still in control. And if we humble ourselves, maybe He'll just heal this land, right? It's what we need to strive for. God's children, His church, must make every effort, as Paul first said, or the title of the sermon, make every effort to keep unity and the oneness of the body, despite any differences, denominations, or any other reasons. The unity of the Spirit must be maintained through the bond of peace until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, full-grown Christians 
attaining to the whole measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. What good are Christians that don't grow to maturity? What about in your life itself? If you stay a baby, you never mature. You never accomplish the things that, that you want to accomplish. So what are the things that you want to accomplish? You have goals in your life. Everybody does. Some more than others. You might have had goals to graduate high school, get married, have children, get a house instead of renting, retirement. I don't know what your goals are. But I know what our goals should be as Christians and what our goals should be as a church. To make a difference in this world to draw others to Jesus Christ. To proclaim the gospel message. To be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. To lack nothing. To grow to full maturity as Paul says. So that we can be in proper service of the Lord. And present the gospel message to others. In a way that they will accept it. That they will see because they'll see the genuineness of our heart. The genuineness of our faith. And we need to be there for each other no matter what. We need to stand united. We need to stand united with our brothers and sisters. So I ask you just like Paul does, will you make every effort to keep unity in the body of Christ? That's my prayer for you today. Father, we thank You so much for Paul's Word. We thank You for Your Spirit that does tie us all together. Your ways are so perfect, Lord, in every way. I can't not even begin to fathom them. But yet as I read your word and I pray, you seem to release more and more of the mystery to me and I'm just overwhelmed and grateful for what you've done. Praise God from whom all blessings flow and worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Thank you for not leaving us as orphans but empowering us with God ourselves, living inside of ourselves. We just thank you and praise you for this. Help us to be the body of Christ that we need to be. Help us especially, Lord, in this church to reach out to our community and make a difference. And then beyond that to this country, Father. There is no reason that this country is hurting so bad and is so far away from God except that we haven't stood up as a church as much as we should have. Forgive us, Father, and help us to draw close to You through the power of Your Spirit. In the bonds of unity and peace, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.